All right, so I, I just had a change of uh, folks for this talk when Glenn was going to thing. So um, I looked around the audience when I was coming in. There's not that many foot and ankle surgeons here, so I think I'm going to take the role of the opposite of the strong man. I'm kind of trying to jam through my slides and focus more on the complications, which are the ones at the end, to kind of uh, give you the opposite perspective of total ankle replacement. Um, I've spoken at a conference in the STAR that used to be for Striker, now it'll be for DJO. Um, there won't be any bias about that, though, here, but I'll show it. Um, <clears throat> Background, bottom line, uh, total hips came out, did great, total knees came out, did great, total ankles, it's in the logical extension, 1970s, they were all just miserable failures, uh, none of them did well. Uh, so any of you that think about, well, I know when I was a resident, total ankles sucked, well that's because they did. <laughs> um, part of the reasons for that, the ankle, it's the same body weight, sometimes some biomechanical studies show even more force, and yet much, much smaller bones, a third of the surface area, so <clears throat> you don't have as much a bone to grab onto, as much immediate stability. The other thing about ankle replacements is demographically it's different. So think about your hips and knees, you know, how many are those post-traumatic? Not a huge number. Total, with an ankle arthritis, 80 to 85 percent of ankle arthritis post-traumatic. So you're going to have a younger demographic uh, in this patient population also. But there's definitely a role for it, which I'll, I'll show you. Um, now, <clears throat> they'll never be the same number of total ankles. Despite that fact, I think there's 10 currently FDA approved, but there's one 20th incidence of hip and knee, uh, of ankle arthritis compared to hip and knee, so we'll never have as many patients getting it. The other thing is a hip and knee fusion is truly a salvage operation, markedly disabling, probably better than not having a limb, but it's not a good surgery. If you have an isolated ankle fusion, 90% of people six months out from an ankle fusion with otherwise normal joints will walk without really detectable limp. So it's very, very different. <clears throat> now, the ideal patient still up for debate. Obviously, older, thin, low demand individuals would be considered good candidates. Chronologic age, body weight are somewhat controversial. Uh, some people, Steve Adab, who's done a ton of these, says there's no upper limit for BMI. I think those of us who do it, the vast majority of us would be hard pressed to on some ways over 250. Um, <clears throat> so what's the typical indication if the patient has, you know, ipsilateral foot arthritis? You fuse that ankle, you're going to put more stress in those joints, they're more likely to develop arthritis more rapidly. Patient with inflammatory arthritis, you obviously want to preserve motion as much as we can, they're going to be low, lower functional demand. Anyhow, if they have pre-existing arthrodesis of other hind foot joints, a pan tailor operation is really a crappy um, functional outcome when all is said and done, so that's not great. And if they have contralateral ankle arthritis, uh, bilateral ankle fusions, it's more difficult. Going up and down hills, even getting out of a chair is more challenging if you can't dorsiflex your ankles, get your center of gravity over your feet. <clears throat> now, contraindications, um, seems like it should, it should go without saying active infection, yes, I think most people understand that, but I've seen patients that had AVN had a total ankle put in. Guess what, it didn't bond to the prosthesis because if you had dead bone, it's not gonna ingrow onto a porous surface. Uh, really poor bone quality, really lousy soft tissue envelope, significant peripheral neuropathy, obviously peripheral vascular disease, sharp cone neuroarthropathy, contraindications. Other things, <clears throat> ligamentous instability, subluxation of talus, deformity, those are relative, certainly with better techniques. We can work, do some of those patients, not all. Uh, if you're missing malleoli, you just you can't do it. And again, poor skin conditions, you probably shouldn't think about doing it. Now, my indication is somewhat evolving. <clears throat> probably uh, in 2007 to 11, when I first started doing these, I probably did one replacement for every three fusions, and now more because of patient demand, I probably do two to three replacements for every one fusion I do. So I'm definitely doing them. Um, I will consider them anybody over the age of 55, and at least in, in Los Angeles, basically nobody smokes anymore, so that's not really an issue. Now, <clears throat> background. Um, I'm just going to show you the slides later about one of the one of the, the uh, agilities you see in the top picture there. Um, I put him in the in the <clears throat> mid 1990s, like Glenn was talking about. Put seven or eight in miserable failure. The Beagle Pappas down below was the three component design. Once the FDA finally figured that out, they pulled it off the market because they said it shouldn't have gotten its 510K. They all have metallic base plate fixed to bone. Uh, they have a polyethylene component between three component designs. It's a mobile bearing. Uh, most of them are two component designs, and rather than Again, I really want to focus on the complications here. So <clears throat> there are eight currently approved two-component designs by FDA. Two-component meaning your, your poly's stuck to the tibial base plate. 
They're listed here. I'll show you a picture of each of the above. There are now two three component designs uh, approved. Three component just means it's got that mobile bearing like your meniscal bearings and knees. Uh, the back side of the poly on the tabial side is not anchored to the tabial component, so it can move a little bit. So here's the agility. Um, bottom line, it's not, it's not even available anymore. Um, it just had a high failure rate, and I'll show you some examples of that later. Um, the other thing that required an arthrodesis is syndesmosis, which is the only one that required that. If it didn't fuse between the tibia and fibula down below, the, the tibia component uniformly failed on these things, and it took a massive amount of bone outs. The, the salvage of the fusion was, was very complicated. Salto Tolaris, so here's where the marketing part goes in. This is available as a three component design in Europe, so to make it available in the US, get on a 510K, they just made a two component design. And they've got good results. <clears throat> I'm not going to do a literature review on any of these things. This is a clever one. It's one I actually first started using in 2007 when I started doing total ankles again. Um, you actually build the stem of this thing. You drop these little segments in, screw it into the stem as you build it. <clears throat> they have Morse taper that tibial base tray on there. You do have to drill a hole in from the bottom of the foot up to make that, but it's kind of clever. You get a stem that long in there without having to window the front of your tibia. <clears throat> and here's my first one in 2007. Pre-existing hind foot fusion, ideal candidate, the patient uh, did well with that. Now, the Infinity is probably the most popular one. It's kind of cool because you can get a uh, patient-specific guide. You get a pre-op CT scan, they give you a guide, you pin to the front of the tibia, so people that don't do a lot of them, that can make the operation a little bit easier. <clears throat> There's a, an instance of radiolucencies on the tibia, but it may or may not be clinically relevant. Um, the Vantage, you can see it's a little bit of variation on theme because some of their doctor wanted uh, royalties or some of their company wanted a piece of the action, so there's the Vantage, <coughs> there's the Cadence. Again, they're kind of similar, slightly different sized pegs. There's a Paragon 28, they just came out with theirs. That's the best picture I could steal off the internet of that one. <coughs> the Zimmer is actually unique in that it's a lateral approach. You actually do a malleolar osteotomy and put this thing in. That way you can just barely take bone off the tibia, preserve a lot more tibial bone stock with the Zimmer. <coughs> you can see a picture here. So, and maybe we can ask Glenn later. Glenn uses the Zimmer, so he's got a lot of experience with that. The Star is the one that I use. It's three-component design, and probably in reality, the only real difference the three-component design makes is it's not, it really doesn't, I don't think, make a big difference on the bone prosthetic interface by having the, the ability to slide on the tibial side. <clears throat> what it does, if you have slightly inaccurate placement of the implant, it compensates for that. Once these things are in, they've done fluoroscopic studies that show the implant, the poly doesn't really move. <clears throat> after time. Here's the first one I did. She did well, which is sometimes not a good thing when you do your first of anything and it's a great result and you're really encouraged to do a lot of them, although I'm, I'm still happy with it. This is the Hintegra. This is just another one. It's not really used much here, but it's, it managed to piggyback in on the, the, the star approval. So <clears throat> arthrodes remains the gold standard for relieving pain. Uh, multiple studies have shown its long-term efficacy. You do an isolated ankle fusion, otherwise normal joints, no existing pre-existing fusions. You have about one-third of the normal sagittal plane motion. These people can walk and function well. Again, in contrast to hip fusions, which are terrible. In some patients like this, an ankle replacement just simply isn't an option. Now, I know there's probably some people in the country would do that, but that's just folly. I mean, that's crazy to try to put a total ankle in a patient with such deficient bone stock. Now, disadvantage of the ankle fusion, yes, they do put added stress in the adjacent joints. It's 20 years down the road, 50% of people have some evidence of our radiographic evidence of arthritis. That's in pre-existing normal joints. If they have pre-existing hind foot arthritis, then there could be some problems. Gait is different. <coughs> um, that, that previous study just showed their um, ankle replacement and fusion have similar pain relief. So it's, it's not a big difference there either. There are more reoperations with anchor replacement fusion, not surprising. There's moving parts, the, the parts wear out eventually with time. <clears throat> so let's, you can do this total length as outpatients. I do all my outpatients. They do as well or better than inpatients. But what can go wrong? So now here's me being the opposite of the strong man up here. A few things. <clears throat> so cyst formation. Uh, this is probably the most common way these things fail, similar to total hips and knees. You get the sense on the lateral view there in the undersurface of the talus, there's a little radiolucency there. You can see it very obviously here on the CT scan. Um, I like to inspect CTs now. It's really nice to mold, the, merge the bone scan showing the biological activity of the bone with the CT findings. You can say, yeah, that, where that cyst is is really lighting up. That bone's unhappy, probably because it's structurally weak, maybe a little bit inflamed. <clears throat> so this patient was bone grafted, but actually did well afterwards. 
Here's another patient had an implant put in, in Europe, came back here. You look at the Taylor component. Under the back side of that, you get the sense there's a cyst there. <clears throat> and man, is there a cyst there. It replaced almost the whole Taylor body under that component. I was going to bone graft this guy. His symptoms went away. I haven't seen him for four or five years now. Here's one with a massively, I don't even know how they got this Taylor uh, table component in there, but is way off center, so debrided that. As the last time I seen a patient didn't break off the medium allelis, but at least got rid of the impingement. Um, here's somebody who's told he'd be playing basketball four months after having his total ankle. He's, here he is a year later, the Taylor component subsided. <clears throat> he had to be salvaged with a fusion. Here's a lady who never had a total ankle in the first place. 83 years old, diabetic, peripheral vascular disease. She's been draining for a year and a half. The outside uh, so affiliated healthcare protect practitioner kind of discharged her. <clears throat> so we did a fusion on her. Here's somebody who had such massive osteolysis, managed to snap off both malleoli. So that was salvaged with the fusion. See, I'm sure I'm talking all of you into doing total ankle placements. That's my opposite of being the strong man here. Here's a rheumatoid patient, triple artesis. Questionable bone quality, snapped off the medium malleus, the whole thing during surgery, had to fix that, but she ended up doing well. <clears throat> Here's another one of these uh, implants put in the Europe, a different patient. And here's my own personal, one of my biggest disasters. This is a patient that had ligamentous instability, which I didn't appreciate at the time of surgery. Here she is at one month, completely dislocated, tibia component didn't stick, so I had to do here she had three months, I had to wait for the wound to heal up, I had to salvage her with the two component design, and of course, the agility. <clears throat> so here's a patient, a media post-op, I think that looks great, so nothing was a long-term result, like the result like long-term fall. Here's six months, <clears throat> concerning rate of lucencies, non-union, the syndesmosis, the patient's happy as a clam. Then he shows up at six years, saying my ankle hurts, massively loose component. I put seven or eight of these things in and had uniformly poor radiographic results, although some of the patients did okay clinically. You can see the third body wear there, <clears throat> did a massive femoral head allograft, probably a little bit too big, and everything was great, until he shows up four years later and he's got heel pain. Of course, the femoral head's collapsed, put in an orthotic, doing great, still haven't seen the guy for like another five years. So I do these, I don't want to take any more time, I've used it my time, but um, but it's, it's a good operation, but there's a lot that can go wrong, and that's my opposite being the strongman. Thank you.